Welcome to the Indian Council of Medical Research online prescribing skills course 2020 for the Indian medical graduate. I am Professor Shuparna Chatterjee of the Department of Pharmacology, Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, Kolkata. Today I shall be talking about prescribing in asthma and COPD. After watching this video, please go to the assignment section and answer five multiple choice questions given and please furnish your feedback also about this module. Why this topic is important? Asthma and COPD as you all know are common obstructive airway diseases and they pose significant health and economic burden. Acute exacerbations of asthma and COPD are also common medical emergencies with an Indian medical graduate has to see and handle. Therefore, an Indian medical graduate must be able to assess cases and prescribe independently at OPD settings, execute and monitor a treatment plan under supervision in emergency settings. He should also be able to counsel and educate patients about the need for medication adherence, regular follow-up and correct use of inhalational devices. On the left, we have the list of topics pertaining to the respiratory system where prescribing competency is required as per the MCI curriculum and we have prioritized for this module obstructive airway disease, asthma and COPD. Pulmonary tuberculosis will be covered separately in the module on tuberculosis and upper respiratory tract disorders will be covered in an ENT module. What are the learning objectives of this module? The learner at the end of the module shall be able to prescribe rationally for the following conditions, treatment knife case of asthma, severe grade exacerbation of asthma, treatment knife case of COPD and also in an acute exacerbation of COPD. You should be able to communicate to the patient information related to the medicines which you have prescribed and give instructions as to how to prevent exacerbations. You should be able to select an appropriate inhalational device for administration of the medicines prescribed. Educate the patient for appropriate use of inhalational devices and medication adherence. Lastly, identify the need for referral to specialist care for further investigation and management if necessary. For rational prescribing, it is important that you must have knowledge about the disease for which you are prescribing. You should have adequate knowledge about the drugs which you have prescribed and the treatment algorithms which you are following for prescribing such drugs. Asthma is a disease of variable airflow obstruction. Reversibility of airflow obstruction is the hallmark of the disease. Either this reversibility occurs spontaneously or following a bronchodilator. Diagnosis is essentially clinical and supported by some investigations. The most important investigation for demonstrating airflow obstruction is spirometry. The two important parameters in spirometry are FEV1, forced expiratory volume in the first second and forced vital capacity and demonstration of bronchodilator reversibility that is improvement of the FEV1 following bronchodilator. At home setting, the patient may be asked to do a peak expiratory flow rate monitoring for understanding the day-to-day -day variations in the levels of airway obstruction. Please follow the stepwise treatment plan for asthma. There are international and national guidelines which need to be followed. For this module, we are referring to the GINA 2019 that is Global Initiative in the Management of Asthma and the ICMR Standard Treatment Workflow 2019 for the management for asthma. Please review the patient at regular intervals, assess the level of asthma control and thereafter treat the patient accordingly. Now let's come to the first scenario. Rima is an 11 year old girl who is brought to the OPD by her parents with the complaints of 4 to 5 episodes of shortness of breath, wheezing, dry cough, occasional night awakening due to cough and wheezing in the last 6 months. There is no history of fever or hemoptysis. She was advised cough syrup and an antibiotic course, but she has not been relieved of her symptoms with these. There is no history of taking any bronchodilators before. She has a family history as her elder brother is asthmatic. On clinical examination, her body weight is 36 kg, the pulse rate and respiration rate are normal. Auscultation of the chest showed bilateral vesicular breath sounds, few polyphonic ronchi over both lungs, but there were no crepitations and the heart sounds were normal. Spirometry investigation was available at the center and therefore it was undertaken. 
the pre bronchodilator ratio of FEV1 by FVC was 0.68 or 60 percent. The post bronchodilator FEV1 increased by 15 percent from the pre bronchodilator value. What is your diagnosis? Your diagnosis is asthma, but how did you arrive at this diagnosis? The patient had typical clinical presentation of asthma, cough, wheezing, chest tightness. This was supported by diagnostics, spirometry was available and we demonstrated airflow obstruction as the FEV1 by FVC ratio was less than 70 percent. Following bronchodilator therapy, FEV1 increased by more than 12 percent. So, these spirometry findings support the diagnosis of asthma. Now, if you are at a center where spirometry is not available or say for example, if you are seeing a child who is less than 7 years where spirometry cannot, can you still make a diagnosis of asthma? Yes, you can make a diagnosis of asthma, but it often needs to be verified by a spirometry. Please refer to the reference number 4, 5 and 7 given at the end of this section. Now, what will you prescribe for this case of asthma? This child of 11 years needs to be given inhalational corticosteroids that is budesonide metered dose inhaler 100 microgram per puff, one puff twice daily to continue for 3 months as she fits into the step 2 in the treatment algorithm. Inhalational corticosteroid called budesonide a disease controller and you also have to prescribe additionally levosalbutamol which is a short acting beta 2 agonist as an immediate reliever. 50 microgram per puff, 2 puffs to be taken immediately if the patient has chest tightness, cough, wheezing. You need to counsel the patient and tell them that in case of increased wheezing or cough, you can use rescue doses of levosalbutamol, 2 puffs at 20 minutes interval, 3 such can be given and if there is still no relief then to contact the attending clinician. What advice do you need to give here? Since you have advised an inhalational corticosteroid that is budesonide, you have to ask the patient to rinse the mouth with water after each time of use of budesonide inhaler and to spit out the water. This is needed because budesonide deposited in the oropharynx can lead to oropharyngeal candidiasis. So, if you rinse the mouth and throw the water away, this adverse effect can be minimized. You shall also have to counsel the patient and the caregivers regarding avoidance of asthma triggers like pollen, house dust, cold air and in adults some drugs like beta blockers, aspirin or NSAIDs can also bring about asthma triggers. Second, you have to counsel the patient regarding some of the features which are indicative of an exacerbation and to come to the emergency if they are not relieved by the rescue medications. You will have to ask the patient to come for the next visit after 2 to 3 months. Please remember that the recent 2019 GINA guidelines and recommendations for adults and adolescents who are more than 11 years states that low dose inhalational corticosteroids have to be taken whenever SABA is taken or as needed low dose ICS formaterol. SABA should not be given alone. Now, when the patient comes for review after 3 months, what will you review? You will review whether the symptoms are adequately controlled. In order to assess the category of control, please refer to the reference material which provides you with details about how we categorize asthma control levels. Please ask the patient how many times per week levosalbutamol meter dose inhaler was needed. This gives you a rough estimate of the extent of reliever use in your patient. Lastly, Please see whether the technique of inhaler use is correct. Now, if the daytime symptoms are more than two times a week, there is presence of nighttime symptoms, relief is needed more than twice a week and there is activity limitation due to asthma. Say for example, in this case, the child is unable to go to school, these indicates asthma is not adequately controlled. If symptoms are not well controlled, what should you do? Please remember that first you should check whether she is adequately adhering to the medications prescribed. Secondly, check whether she is adopting the correct technique for MDI use. If you find these are ok, then only you should go to the next higher step for asthma treatment. In this case, she was already taking low dose inhalational corticosteroid and need based SABA that is levosalbutamol. 
the next highest step will be low dose inhalational corticosteroid plus a long acting beta 2 agonist like formaterol. We have fixed dose combination inhalers of budesonide and formaterol which can be prescribed. The other options can be either to escalate the dose of inhalational corticosteroids to medium dose inhalational corticosteroid or you can give low dose inhalational corticosteroids and an oral leukotriene receptor antagonist like Montenucust. These are to be used as controller medication and a need based SABA. All details about the dose categories what is low dose, what is medium dose and what is high dose inhalational corticosteroids are all given in the reference material. Case scenario 2. Mrs. Benita, 65 year old diagnosed asthmatic patient has been taking formaterol with budesonide meter dose inhaler regularly, but she is brought to the emergency with severe respiratory distress. She could not lie in bed, she could hardly talk except for a few words. She had taken several additional puffs of levosalbutamol for the last one day, but did not get relief. On clinical examination, her blood pressure was 110 by 80 millimeter of mercury. Respiration rate was increased, it was 32 per minute. The accessory muscles of respiration were being used. The pulse rate was 150 signifying tachycardia. There was no central cyanosis and pulse oximetry showed 90 percent saturation in room air. Chest auscultation showed poor air entry, there were scattered ronchi, but the heart sounds were normal. So, a provisional diagnosis of acute exacerbation of asthma severe grade was made. What will you do for this patient? You have to admit this patient and you have to treat her immediately. Closely monitor the patient and see how she is responding to treatment. How will you treat this case? You have to start oxygen inhalation, but oxygen saturation has to be maintained at 93 to 95 percent. In this case, you have to start nebulization. Nebulization with levosalbutamol and ipratropium, which is a short acting antimuscarinic agent. 1.25 milligram and 0.5 milligram dose respectively. Three doses can be given at 20 minutes interval and then as needed at 4 to 6 hours interval. Remember there is a role of systemic glucocorticoids in acute se severe asthma management. Parenterally hydrocortisone 100 milligram IV stat dose and thereafter 100 milligram 8 hourly can be given. But if the patient can take drugs orally, oral prednisolone at a dose of 40 to 50 milligrams for 4 to 5 days can be given. As the patient responds and improves, please switch from injection to oral and from nebulization to meter dose inhaler. What are the signs of improvement which suggest that the patient can be discharged? These are significant improvement in the symptoms and improved oxygen saturation that is more than 94 percent at room air. The peak exploratory flow is improving that is 60 to 80 percent of the predicted best or the personal best. If these are present then you can plan for discharge, but please ask the patient to come for follow up after one week. But more importantly you should know some of the red flag signs. What are these red flag signs? These indicate that the patient's clinical status is worsening. What are they? Altered sensorium that is either the patient is agitated or becomes drowsy, presence of central cyanosis worsening hypoxemia, increased CO2 levels, hypotension or bradycardia. Please refer to the reference numbered 4, 5 and 7 regarding the details of management of an acute severe asthma. Mild or moderate asthma exacerbations can be managed at home by increasing the dose of the existing treatment which she is having. Some do's and don'ts regarding asthma management. The mainstay of pharmacotherapy in asthma is giving drugs by the inhalational route. Assess the level of asthma control at each visit and treat accordingly. Step up or step down treatment as per the level of asthma control is advocated. Monitor the technique of inhalational device use. Educate the patient about treatment adherence, avoidance of asthma triggers, warning signs of exacerbation and ask the patient to do peak exploratory flow rate monitoring for assessing the diurnal variation of obstruction. Refer for further evaluation and management if the disease remains poorly controlled. Some of the don'ts, do not over prescribe relievers instead of controllers. Say for example, if a patient says that he or she needs daily short acting beta 2 agonists as relievers, 
it indicates that the controller medications prescribed to the patient is inadequate and you need to step up treatment. Do not prescribe antimuscarinic drugs for childhood asthma patients. It is always preferable to give short acting beta 2 agonist by the inhalational route and not by the oral route. Do not prescribe oral corticosteroids for prolonged period except for short term use for acute severe asthma exacerbation. Do not prescribe antibiotics indiscriminately in acute exacerbation of asthma until there is a strong clinical suspicion that this exacerbation is due to bacterial infection. Do not treat cough in asthma with cough suppressants. Now we come to the second disease of our module that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Some of the salient points about it. COPD is also an obstructive airway disease where there is persistent airflow limitation and it commonly affects the adults and smokers. Just remember that there may be biomass fuel exposure or exposure to environmental or occupational pollutants. The common symptoms of COPD are chronic cough with sputum production and shortness of breath or dyspnea. When the disease progresses, there can be complications like pulmonary hypertension and cardiac failure. The investigation for confirming a diagnosis of COPD is essentially spirometry and the details are given in the reference. Chest x-ray may be done to exclude other causes or to identify whether any lung and cardiac changes have taken place. Please remember to check for other comorbidities if they are present. Now, what are the treatment goals? Relief of symptoms, improving exercise tolerance and to reduce exacerbations or to prevent them and reduce complications. You have to realize the importance of asking the patient to stop smoking and to control for other risk factors like biomass fuel exposure especially in the women, avoidance of environmental and occupational pollutants. There is also a need for influenza and pneumococcal vaccination. Judicious use of antibiotics when you suspect uh, acute exacerbation of COPD due to bacterial causes. Pulmonary rehabilitation is also important in the therapy of patients suffering from COPD. Now let us come to a case scenario. Mr. Debashish, a 50 year old male smoker for the last 10 years he has been smoking has come to the OPD with a history of shortness of breath which is worsened by exercise and chronic cough with expectoration which is occurring for several months over the last 2 years. On examination, you find that the BP is normal, the pulse rate is also normal and so is the respiration rate. The chest auscultatory findings are diminished vesicular breath sounds with prolonged expiration. Investigation chest x-ray was done which showed hyperinflated lung fields. Spirometry was available and these are the following parameters. The pre bronchodilator FEV1 was 1.42 liters, the post bronchodilator FEV1 was 1.46 liters. The ratio of FEV1 by FVC was 0.66 with bronchodilator. Now, what is your diagnosis? Your diagnosis is COPD, but how did you arrive at the diagnosis? The patient is a male smoker and he is having clinical signs and symptoms of COPD that is cough with sputum production, dyspnea. It was supported by diagnostics that is spirometry which demonstrated airflow obstruction as the FEV1 by FVC was less than 70%. But the improvement with bronchodilator was less than 12 percent. This is an important distinguishing factor between COPD and asthma. In asthma in an adult patient, you will find that with bronchodilator therapy, the improvement of FEV1 is 12 percent or more and more than 200 ml. What will you prescribe for this case? In this case, you should prescribe tiotropium, which is a long acting antimuscarinic agent as a meter dose inhaler 9 microgram per puff 2 puffs once daily and a need based saba that is levosalbutamol meter dose inhaler 50 microgram per puff 2 puffs as needed. What additional advice do you need to give to this patient that he should quit smoking and consider vaccination against influenza and pneumococcus. Please refer to reference numbered 6 and 8 regarding the different algorithms to be followed for COPD. We generally referred to the gold guidelines and also to the ICMR standard treatment workflow for the treatment and management of COPD. This slide shows you the treatment plan of COPD as per the ICMR standard treatment workflow. Please remember that whether it is a mild case, moderate case or a severe case, if the symptoms are persisting then you need to add on tiotropium for mild COPD. 
For a moderate COPD, you may consider adding a low dose methylxanthine and for a severe COPD case who is not getting adequate relief of symptoms with ICS and LABA and need best SABA, in that case you can add a LAMA and or a low dose methylxanthine. Refer the patient if there is inadequate response or if there is onset of new complications or suspicion of alternate diagnosis. Now, how will you treat a case of acute COPD exacerbation? A case of acute COPD exacerbation usually presents with increase in the intensity of cough or the severity of dyspnea. Mild and moderate cases can be treated at an OPD basis, but severe cases need to be hospitalized. Controlled oxygen therapy needs to be given, but you must ensure that the oxygen saturation is maintained at 92 to 94 percent. Bronchodilator therapy needs to be increased and nebulization with levosalbutamol and iprotropium is often indicated. Antibiotics need to be given only when you suspect that there is bacterial infection. Often the nature of the sputum is suggestive as to whether bacterial infection is present along with other investigations. Select an appropriate antibiotic based on the guidelines which are available. Escalate or de-escalate antibiotics based on the clinical response and the microbiology reports. Oral corticosteroids like prednisolone 40 mg per day in an adult patient needs to be given as a short course. If comorbidities are present, modify the treatment accordingly. For severe cases, you may need non-invasive ventilation and this is essentially based on clinical and other investigational parameters like arterial blood gas. This slide shows you the commonly used inhalational devices. On the left panel, we have a meter dose inhaler. A meter dose inhaler is most commonly used for treating patients of asthma and COPD. This is mainly indicated for adults. However, those patients who do not have adequate hand breath coordination, for them you need to give a meter dose inhaler with a spacer. Below is the picture of a meter dose inhaler with small volume spacer and face mask. These inhaler with a small volume spacer and face mask can be used in children or in elderly subjects or in adults who do not have good hand breath coordination or actuation. On the right upper panel, we have a dry powder inhaler, a rotahaler. The advantage of a dry powder inhaler use is that for these devices, you do not need hand breath actuation, but you need a very good inspiratory flow rate to deliver the drugs. Now, here the drugs are given as a powder and a good amount of this may be deposited in the throat and therefore, there may be some amount of throat irritation. And in the lower panel, you will see a large volume spacer. There is a video on the correct technique for inhalational device use in the effective communication module and I request you to kindly refer to this module to watch that particular video. This shows a picture of a compressed air nebulizer. We commonly use it in emergency settings. Here the drugs are given a solution in the nebulizing chamber and these drugs are now converted into a mist and an aerosol which the patient inhales through a face mark. Please ensure that the mask fits tightly around your nose and mouth so that there is no leakage of the drugs. On the right we have a peak flow meter. This peak flow meter can be used by the patient at home or you can use it at an OPD setting where you are seeing a patient. It gives you a rough estimation of the extent of airflow obstruction and to monitor the patient's extent of airflow obstructions. So the take home message for this module, ensure your diagnosis correct before prescribing. Try to prescribe drugs which are in the list of national list of essential medicine. Try to prescribe drugs which are in the national list of essential medicines. Select the appropriate inhalational device which suits best for your patient. Please check the contraindications of drugs before prescribing. Follow stepwise treatment plan for asthma and algorithm based treatment for COPD. For exacerbations of asthma and COPD, assess the patient status carefully and treat accordingly. The importance of patient education regarding medication adherence, correct technique of inhalational use device, avoidance of triggers of asthma is equally important. 
these are the list of the abbreviations used for the module. For detailed prescribing information about drugs, you can have a look at the prescriber's digital reference with the link given. For detailed treatment and management plan, please consult the reference material. You can also refer to the National Formulary of India regarding prescribing information about drugs or international formularies like the British National Formulary. These are the references for the module, the acknowledgement. I thank you very much for watching this online module and request you to answer the five multiple choice questions given in the assignment section and please do furnish your feedback also about this module. Thank you once again and happy learning.